It might sound a bit odd, but why a cast iron tape dispenser? If you think about it, apart from being super heavy duty, its weight allows for it to be used one handed as it won't move when you go to pull some tape out. This version was made in Australia under a brand called Bear, owned by the Bear Manning Company, until it was bought out by the Norton Abrasives Company in the mid 1950s and subsequently Saint Gobain in the 1990s. The old slogan for their transparent cellulose tape was a little bear will fix it and they still use the bear logo on their products today. Styling and basis for the design borrows heavily from the earlier made 3M version. To make copies they would just need an original 3M version, pack it in some sand to create a mould and then pour liquid metal into it. This process is called casting. This one appears to be very well used up until recently where someone has attempted to repair it. I'm basing this off the fact that some of the areas have been sanded and not re-rusted over yet. It's not the best job but probably got a few more years out of it despite damaging it in the process. I'm anticipating that the majority of the restoration will be clean up along with some repair of the serrated cutting edge. Some things to note. The previous repair job seems to consist of gluing some wooden dowels under the cutting edge to make up for it getting dull over time. This lifted the cutting edge making it easier to tear pieces off. With an item like this, the key is to be gentle and take your time to ensure a good quality outcome. I'm not very good at following that advice so I went straight for my pliers to see if the glue would let go and everything would just pop straight apart. This wasn't the case and it turned out that this little screw was the cause. It may explain why it's been filed down to nothing as the last person tried to get it out. On the bright side, that gives me an excuse to crack out the power tools and see what I can do with these. With something like this, I want to avoid damaging the cast iron, so I'll start off with a small drill bit and try and pull out the little bits of wood around that. If that doesn't work, I'll move up a size to the next drill bit and repeat the process. I'm using my Stanley knife here to make a small divot for the drill to sit in. This should help find the center and avoid hitting anything while I'm drilling. It's going to be a slow process, but you can't rush this type of thing. Okay, so I can, but that's so you don't have to listen to the drill whining the whole time. The smaller hole can be referred to as a pilot hole, so if you think of a pilot guiding a plane, a pilot hole will help larger drill bits follow the same path as the smaller one. It just makes life a little bit easier because those bigger drill bits do tend to wander. You might not notice it now, but if you look carefully later on, you'll see that I actually did end up making a little bit of a gouge in the cast iron body. At least I'll be able to take this serrated edge off now though. I thought this part was a screw that somebody had filed down, so I took a hacksaw blade out of my hacksaw just so that it would fit in the area and tried to recreate the slot that I thought would have been on top so I could remove it with a screwdriver. After cutting the slot, I got out a stubby screwdriver and a set of pliers to use as a makeshift impact driver. A normal impact driver is something you hit with a hammer and it turns that striking force into a rotational force for getting out stuck screws. This method, I just use my thumb to hold pressure on the screw and the pliers provide the rotation. So it's actually a rivet, which would have probably had a button shaped head, not a flat slotted head. So what's the difference? A screw usually has a slotted head and a steepest thread to it, whereas a rivet is usually hit with something like a hammer and deforms into shape, holding whatever it's meant to hold in place. Now that I've finally got that piece out of the way, I can go through and clean up all this muck that was hiding behind it. There's still some glue attached there, but it comes off really easily. 
Next we're going into a degreaser wash, taking off all the grease and grime that has built up over the years from people's hands and general usage. Hopefully the paint underneath will still be in good condition after this cleanup. As I'm cleaning here though, I'm finding that the paint is rubbing off too. It doesn't seem that thick and will be hard to save. You can see the water is starting to turn brownie green. At this stage I decided to give it a light sand just to see what I was working with and which direction I should take this restoration. I could see some more of the detail that was buried under the paint coming through. Looking at what was left of the feet, they would have been much larger rubber feet way back when it was made, but they've perished over time. So I'll remove most of what is left and see if I can add some new feet later on. Don't forget to double tap. I started with a rough file here, but soon discovered to get this smooth would take away a lot of the metal and the original character, so I switched up tactics a little bit. I decided to use a brass wire wheel in the hand grinder, which is a lot more gentle on the metal, as the brass is softer than the cast iron. It seems more aggressive than it is, but it can shoot out small pieces of wire which could stick in your skin. A little gap in time too also meant that some surface rust crept back in so I had to come through and clean it with another type of brass brush. I did say earlier that I wasn't going to file anything but the lumps in these grooves would have gotten in the way of the paint and left sections vulnerable to rusting. Also they weren't that even especially towards the bottom there so I cleaned that up a bit. I also did a little bit of shaping with a bastard file just to even out where the cutting edge would go later on. It was also handy to take out the seams left from the casting process. Basically when it is poured into a mould there are gaps so it can be taken out later. Metal can leak through these gaps and if it's not an obvious spot they'd usually just leave them there. Cleaning and shaping this cutter wasn't too difficult. I used a hammer for getting it flat and the pliers helped bend small areas back to being where they should be. Fun fact, you would hear people call this style of tape dispenser a whale tail due to their distinctive art deco shape. And now that I've said that, you really can't unsee it. A lot of the cleanup for the cutter was removing old glue and a little bit of surface rust. There were bits of damage on there I couldn't get rid of completely else I would have ended up filing through in areas or just weakening the whole thing. After I've done the rough clean with the files and the rough sandpaper, I came through with the drill mounted sanding discs. These things are great. I got them to restore some headlight covers and they come in a kit that most automotive stores sell. Finally, I added a little bit of polish and I gave them a buff with another set of drill mounted buffing pads that I again got from an automotive store and they come in really handy for these small tiny polishing jobs. Once it's all polished up, the polish will leave a little bit of wax on the surface which should stop any future rusting. As for this little twist rivet that I've butched into being a screw, I just gave it a quick file, sand and then a buff just like the cutter. Now for the tape wheel. It seems I was lucky to find this part still with the dispenser as they can go missing. It's in great shape too so I'll scrape off most of the old paint give it a quick sand and then a bit of fresh paint to cover everything up. I'm not too worried about leaving a bit of the old paint there as long as it's even. Also these little red Stanley blade holders make life so much easier when you're cleaning up things like this. They only cost like a buck. It's important to still sand these surfaces even just a little bit. 
it just roughens up the surface a touch and it gives it a key for the paint. So basically a key just means that it, it's got something for the paint to grip onto as it dries as opposed to being on a smooth surface where it can just peel off easily. As for the pre-paint prep, ooh nice alliteration, a little bit of terps on a rag will be plenty. It just takes any dust and loose material off so it doesn't get stuck under the paint and later turn into a potential rust spot or an imperfection. I masked up the little parts on the side as later on there'll be a contact point with the body and any paint I put on there will rub off. Eventually they'll get a little bit of oil put on them just to stop any future rust. This epoxy enamel is a bit of overkill but it will definitely protect the surface for at least the next 80 years. Also it came in a colour that I thought was pretty close to the original so I was happy with that. The paint for the tape wheel was just something I had lying around. I just wanted to get it sealed and stop any further rusting but I'm also pretty happy with the colour. rubber feet didn't end up going on too well. I ended up getting some double sided tape later on and that did a much better job of holding them in place. They're just the type you'd get from the hardware store to go under table legs to stop them sliding on smooth floors. The idea is that you need a little bit of grip or otherwise the whole thing's just going to move when you try and pull some tape out. Reassembling this part was just doing everything in reverse from when I took it apart. It wasn't that difficult I just had to make sure I was a bit more gentle this time. Quite happy with how everything turned out, the overall look and style is just what I was looking for and it still retains a little bit of that original character. There are a few little things I could have improved but at the end of the day my tape fits in there nicely and it works exactly how it should, one handed tape dispensing. If you enjoyed this video let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, we'll see you next time.